We gotta rise up, rise up, rise up. They say it's to protect you while they try to dispossess you of the right to decide between wrong or right to openly discuss what politicians hide they want to keep their secret plans from the public eye we gotta keep our fires burning keep our spirits bright we gotta rise up rise up rise up rise up people against the war rise up people against the war Rise up people against the war, rise up people. Money got no children, and bombs ain't for building. And killing ain't no way to make a peaceful day, as all of God's children can easily explain. We gotta keep our fires burning, keep our spirits bright. Stand up and speak for what we know is right. We gotta rise up, rise up, rise up. Against the war, rise up people against the war, rise up people against the war, rise up people. Uh, Veterans for Peace Forum. Uh, welcome back again. We do this every fourth Saturday. And uh, today I have a guest on here with me who's a, a friend of mine. We go back to college together. Uh, Doug Lane, he's a, uh, he's a author, uh, a science fiction writer, um, and a podcast host. Uh, he does interviews with people around the world on various issues from literature to, um, I would say, uh, what is it, uh, surrealism, philosophy, uh, a number of different things. Um, I'm starting to hear a little feedback there uh, from something else. Uh, just to let you know, uh, the other thing is, is uh, I wanted to do a little bit of a shout out because before coming in today, a friend of mine was uh, getting married and that was uh, Megan Heiss and uh, Craig Henneke. They just uh, had a wedding at the uh, at Lawhurst Park today around 4:30, and both of them have been incredible activists uh, and good friends of mine. And uh, and I just want to say it was a beautiful wedding. Uh, people I hadn't seen for a while. Uh, one young woman, uh, Brenda Salas, who came from Chile uh, to read uh, a poem that uh, uh, <clears throat> read for the uh, event. Uh, uh, both she read it in Spanish and and uh, another uh, person read it in uh, L Lorraine Shear read the English part. 
uh, both families. It was nice to meet part of their family. And I just wanted to say uh, congratulations, and I know they're going to have a wonderful life together, and Portland's going to benefit from all their activism. They're with Portland Central American Solidarity Committee and, uh, and CISPUS and uh, bringing in speakers and doing active work around non-intervention in Latin America and, uh, and being part of also the Occupy movement here in Portland, which is another important thing. Uh, one, a couple of things. I have a couple of announcements I wanted to raise because August 10th is going to be Agent Orange Day. And as many people who have been watching this program for a long period of time know that I myself am a victim of Agent Orange. Uh, I had a son that was born with a congenital heart disease and other abnormalities and uh, died at the age of three uh, due to uh, complications and surgery. Uh, that's, Casey was just uh, one of many, many thousands, millions of children that have suffered from Agent Orange and way after the war had ended. Uh, right now, um, in Agent Orange Day is going to take place, like I said, on August 10th. They're asking that people take 51 seconds of silence and 51 seconds of action. And so the 51 seconds of silence reflects the 51 years of spraying Agent Orange uh, and 51 years of suffering of the victims of Vietnam and around the world. Um, also, 51 seconds of action is to let your Congress, uh, congressional representatives know that there is a bill in place to ask that uh, there's reparations paid to the victims in Vietnam and to Vietnam veterans. Many Vietnam veterans, like my son, was not recognized as um, uh, related, his illness is related to Agent Orange. And there are many uh, male veterans uh, whose children, unless they had spina bifida, uh, is not recognized. Well, there's a lot of anecdotal uh, um, uh, recordings of, of many, many veterans who came back whose high incidences of Agent Orange with children with birth defects are uh, incredible. In fact, I'm now uh, in conversations with people who are the third generation of, uh, of veterans. Uh, some of them, uh, there's a uh, daughter of vet Vietnam veterans of Agent Orange. Uh, there's um, uh, another organization which is uh, <clears throat> the children of Vietnam veterans also that deal with not only Agent Orange but burn pit uh, exposure because they're looking at not only the issues that affected veterans during the Vietnam War but also the veterans that, have, that were affected in the recent uh, wars in Afghanistan and, uh, and in Iraq where they were exposed to highly toxic chemicals also, and many of the Gulf War veterans are, have, many of them are passing away, or they're having very severe illnesses, and they're having children with birth defects. So that's one I just wanted to let you know about. I will be in, um, in Miami at this time. Uh, the Veterans for Peace uh, a National Convention is taking place in Miami. Uh, their central theme there is going to be around Latin America. We have uh, Father Roy Bourgeois, who will be, uh, who's you know been sort of the spearhead of uh, of um, the School of America's Watch, and he will be one of the key speakers there. Uh, also, uh, Alice Walker, uh, who many of you know, great poet, writer, uh, and social critic of uh, many of the things that are going wrong in our society. But she'll also be leading a delegation to Haiti after the convention. So that's just, if you want to find out more about that, go to uh, veteransforpeace.org. We have it up on the screen. And you can click on the convention and see what's available. If you're down in that area, it'd be great. Um, another announcement I want to make is uh, I'm working with uh, a number of uh, young returning veterans, post 9-11 vets. And they're going to do a workshop on permaculture. It's called Permaculture Design Course for Military Veterans. It's going to be August 8th to the 21st in Oregon City. And if you want more information about that I'd like to attend, you can call 360-388-1242 uh, or you can email info veteranstransitioncore.org. Uh, this is a program in which you know, the value of this program would be like um, about $1,100 just to go to a program like this. But if you're a veteran and you can't afford to do that, uh, it's going to be made available. No veteran is going to be turned away. You can pay whatever you can. 
Uh, so please check into this. It's a great opportunity. They're working on a project called Boots, <coughs> Boots to Roots, which is looking at um, uh, organic uh, farming and gardening as a means to transition for veterans from from the war back into uh, our society. And we know right now there's no job, so this is a great way for people to keep busy, but also, you know, one of the reasons people go to war is for these resources and for the capitalist class and for, and people don't like me using the word capitalist, so you can use corporations, you can use whatever you want in this uh, dialogue. But today, we wanna talk a little bit about capitalism because I have with me Doug Lane, and Doug is, uh, like I said, a science fiction writer, but he's, he writes his books. Uh, he's got uh, one book here is called uh, Wave of Mutilation. Uh, author, he was also the author of uh, Fall Into Time. I just want to show both of these books if you can see those. Thank you, Dan. And that's good. We've got that. And a book that uh, I helped work on the cover, which yeah. I really liked, was called Pick Your Battles. One of the best covers. This is <laughs> one of the best covers we have. Yeah. And uh, it, this is when I started talking to Doug, we would have conversations about things he was writing. But he started getting back into more philosophy. Mm -hmm. And when you started doing this, Doug, yeah, um, you know, I, I said that there was a lot of things that you started off with this and looking at sort of foraging in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. but you began a philosophical well, way of looking at it. Yeah. For this book, was I tried to um, combine two concepts. One is pretty familiar to probably your audience, the idea of urban foraging, right. which is just you go out into your neighborhood and find plants and um, um, fruits, tr fruit trees uh, that are on public land or are hanging outside you know, of a fence maybe from right. your neighbor's yeah. fence, but see that are accessible. Uh, and don't give you a sense that you're robbing someone when you pick the berries. Um, so that's urban foraging. The other idea that I wanted to, to use was uh, an idea that I picked up from the Situationists, which who were a group of French radicals and philosophers, but they probably wouldn't have called themselves philosophers, um, who uh, worked on the idea of uh, a derive or a, a wander. Um, back in the 50s and in the uh, 60s, early 60s in France. And what they would do is in Paris, they would go out and try to map the psychogeography of Paris by pretty much by getting drunk and just staying on the streets for days, wandering and going wherever they were led to go by the geography, by the architecture of the city. Well, isn't that what philosophy is? Kind of a drunken wandering? Well, <laughs> whenever we get together and, and talk, I'm sure I give you the impression that, that that's what philosophy is, is a drunken wandering. And But um, it certainly was a, a, a part of what their philosophy was about. But they weren't just um, having fun, They, although yeah. they were. Um, they were trying to determine uh, how the built environment that they were living in uh, directed them, yeah. and how uh, the uh, cityscape was determining their own uh, psyche, their own imagination. Um, so I wanted to do my own wandering from my own neighborhood and see how the suburban uh, streets of southeast Portland kind of formed and shaped my own consciousness as I was looking for maybe cracks in my life where fruit trees or, or, or weeds would be growing and that I could harvest. And mm -hmm. that was what I did with this book. What I discovered was that the uh, seeming interstitial spaces, the alleys that I would wander down, mm -hmm. um, these practices of, uh, of foraging were really supplements to the life I was living. They weren't escapes. They were just ways to... Uh, supplement and, and support the life that I was living, that this was not an actual alternative to uh, suburban American life. It was just a, a different kind of lifestyle within Well, how, do, how does that play into capitalism? I mean, that's what we said we were gonna talk a little bit sure. about. How does that play into capitalism? And looking at it, uh, let's let the people know that you do a class uh, on Hegel, right? Right uh, now I'm doing a philosophy uh, workshop, workshop on Hegel, yeah. Online. Online. How do people 
get involved in that, by the way? Well, they can email me, or they can contact me on my Facebook page or through Twitter. The main thing to do is to listen to the Diet Soap podcast. Okay. Check out a couple of the previous podcasts about Hegel and then see if you're interested. If you are, usually what people are doing is subscribing to pay like 10 to $15 a month to participate. Right. And that supports me in the podcast. But when we're, when we're talking about Hegel, the reason you're studying Hegel is one of the things well, that Marx was Hegel, yeah, supposedly Marx. turned him on. I mean, so let's go back and, and say why I wrote this book about um, picking your battle okay. and how I did it. I, um, in 2008, I was working at Comcast mm -hmm. and I had been writing um, fiction for a long time and I had had a book deal come through for a novel, which is finally going to come out next year. But I was kind of waiting for that to happen, and it was taking a long time, and it's taking a long time. And while that uh, I was waiting, George Bush came on television and told the nation that we were probably going to enter into another Great Depression. I mean, that it was, uh, there was an economic catastrophe on the level that none of us had seen in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And he had that kind of Bambi caught in the headlights look again that we saw <laughs> in 2000. And he, this scared me more. This scared me more than 9-11. Um, I really was very concerned about my future, my family's future, and the country's future after that. Um, I didn't quite know what had happened, but I wanted to. So I started uh, a podcast. Um, and I, I was inspired by a podcast uh, called The Sea Realm. And this uh, guy named KMO, who does The Sea Realm podcast, would interview doomers and permaculture people and people who, like Dmitry Orlov, who talks about uh, buying your own boat and just taking off and trying to live on your own as, as ecologically as possible. And so this was the kind of mentality I had. And what I realized as I set down the course of going of, of doing my own podcast and interviewing uh, my own collection of experts, people like Michael Parente and uh, oh, recently uh, uh, Andrew Kleiman and and Brendan Cooney and Jody uh, Jody Dean, um, was that a lot of the ways that we thought about the economic crisis uh, were uh, themselves structuring the kinds of answers we could come up with. In other words, we were asking the wrong questions about okay. what was happening. And so uh, as I wrote this book and tried to wander through my neighborhood, I tried to find ways to ask new questions of myself and the life that I was in. And so that led me to Marx, reading Marx and trying to figure out what capitalism really is. It, um, that now reading Marx has led me to Hegel. And all of this has kind of led me back into philosophy to try to figure out just what is the world? What are, what are we, where are we exactly? A lot of the things we take for granted, we maybe ought not to. So uh, that's what Diet Soap is about, my podcast. And right. that's also largely what my writing is about. Um, right. So if we're going to talk about, uh, you know, some, like I said, some people uh, always shy away from the language capitalism. Uh, they get into capitalism versus communism, socialism, and all these are, and oh, Obama is uh, one of these uh, great socialists. Well, I'm no fan of Obama, but I, he's no way close to being a socialist right. uh, um, <clears throat> or a communist or any of these things. It seems to be the word that they attach to anybody that's starting to look at asking the questions, you know, mm -hmm. why are we living this way? Why are some people uh, <clears throat> have this incredible amount of wealth uh, we, we go to work every day. How does our participation in producing a product, uh, what share do we, do we get involved in here? Uh, but when you start talking about Marx, you are also really investigating that uh, value of labor. Mm, yeah. Um, so yeah. you want to explain that a little bit? I sure. think you know. You yeah, really I mean, to... I feel like uh, yeah. really I ought to bring some of the people I've talked to for my podcast onto your show <laughs> to kind of describe <laughs> this to you. Um, because while I know a little bit from talking to them and doing some reading, there are a lot of people who understand this a lot more than I do. And I'd recommend people check out Andrew Kleiman or the Marxist Humanist Initiative to really, um, he has a great book called... Uh, uh, the Failure of Capitalist Production, which I've read, which I recommend uh, as a kind of an introduction. Or, or No, it's not really an introduction. It's an explanation of the current economic crisis from a really, a truly Marxist perspective. Um, 
I am not someone, I, uh, for a long time I was an anarchist, considered myself to be an anarchist. I guess now I would consider myself to be a wannabe Marxist. And what the wannabe part is this, I want to understand Marx's critique of capitalism. Um, so that's largely what's motivating me these days in, in terms of my podcast and when I get guys like Andrew Kleiman on my, my show. Uh, I think that you mentioned that uh, a lot of people are reluctant to blame capitalism right. and use that word. I would say that equally true is that a lot of people will say they are against capitalism when they're against something else, when they're against unfair distribution or uh, corporate control. Um, and they'll conflate corporatism and capitalism in a way that uh, undermines a thoroughgoing critique of capitalism itself. It's like uh, everyone agrees that you know, the mom and pop shop is fine, but you know, we're against corporate America. Well, the mom and pop shop is fine. Um, and corporate America actually is fine too, uh, if what you want to do is continue to have this kind of economic system. And most people actually do want to continue to have this kind of economic system. But they want system. the distribution differently. They would like to get more money. They're, 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 you were talking about, I mean, we talk about this quite often, is yeah. there's the idea of uh, regulation. And you've got, you know, you have uh, a libertarian point of view, which is against war and, and is, uh, you know, uh, uh, seems like it has a human face of, of capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, if we just make a kinder, gentler capitalism with a, a thousand points of light, as right. Bush said, you know, Bush one said, uh, we, we'd be fine. But we're talking about is really that there's a real failure. We're in a crisis, right. and this is not a crisis that is a failure of capitalism. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the system itself, the way in which it operates. And one of those systems of exchange is money, and you wanted to talk about money. Sure, I do. People, uh, people just want to change the distribution of money, but you want to, you want to say that money is part of the problem. Well, right? uh, money is part of the problem. The main part of the problem, the problem we're facing is how to organize ourselves as, and and how to run society uh, fundamentally. I mean, what we've got now is an economic system that goes into crisis, and that relies on a class structure where the majority of people are exploited. Um, I think we could do better than that. I think mm -hmm. capitalism is a lot better than what came before it. I'm not wanting any kind of return to feudalism, feudalism or, or tribalism mm -hmm. or I'm not a primitivist. I don't think that we should all you know, give up our dishwashers and, and go live in teepees or anything like that. I, I actually like industrial technological society. But I don't like what it takes to make it right now. What it takes to make it is a very rigid class society where the majority of people have to work um, to produce value uh, for capitalists and for institutions um, so that those institutions can grow and they don't reap the rewards of their own labor. And I would say that we, that we have to go to war to maintain it and maintain power sure. and control. Uh, we need a police state in which able to hold people back from uh, right. uh, demanding uh, their rights. Uh, all of these various things, there's, there's a control keeping that system in place. Right. And so it creates all these other things. But if, you, if, you, but if, you, focus on, um, mm. if you focus on the wars or the police brutality or um, these symptoms of what's wrong, then you're going to miss what what's really happening because the, what's really happening is something that works. It's not, it's got a contradiction in it and it doesn't work perfectly, but it does work. If it didn't work, we wouldn't be here. There wouldn't, the machines wouldn't be running, the electricity wouldn't be running. Capitalism works. It just has consequences. If you don't like the consequences, you have to come up with something that works well, just as well. Well, but now we've got to talk about capitalism because, again, there's definitions here. Right. Because if you talk about capitalism from the or the economy from the, the the view of let's say conservatives or libertarians or uh, various people that support the system as is you're really talking about people who are talking about they use the term free market first of all that's uh, an assumption there's no such thing as a free market right you talk about there's regulations why we have nation states actually were created in order for capitalism to begin 
the sure. Industrial Revolution and to control that. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about nation states, you need the nation state to centralize the idea of what, how that economy is going to be run right, and right. controlled, right? Right. That also, those, those different nations then are in business of um, uh, exporting or what they call uh, various uh, comparative advantage. But, but uh, what is, what's the nation state really doing? I mean, most of all, the nation state is there to regulate uh, the economic system that takes place in the production, productive uh, process. It's what, what capitalism really is about is getting a whole bunch of people together, organized and, and cooperating to make things, mm -hmm. okay? And they don't, they make two kinds of things. They make actual physical things that we use, and then they also make something that uh, Marx thinks is even more important, which is that they make something called abstract value. There you go. Okay, so what you've got with, with this is why philosophy is important. So it's that abstract value that Marx wants to point out to people and say, look, what's going on is that you've got uh, a system where uh, the majority of people have to be exploited, and they have to be exploited not in terms of use values, although that may be the consequence. They have to be exploited in terms of the abstract labor value that they produce and that is embodied in commodities every day. This is a really tough concept, but it's important to understand because once you understand that you're creating an abstract value, then you understand that you might have the potential to create something else, that there may be some other way to organize your days and your, organize your fellow men to make things. There might and be women. some other abstract idea that would drive society. Right now, it's this quantifiable abstract labor value that's embodied in commodities. Mm -hmm. I mean, the problem with reading Marx and trying to understand Marx is that you start sounding like a Marxist when you talk, <laughs> and that really turns people off. And you start you start talking the jargon. Well, let's 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 look at something that you've been doing. I mean, one of the things you've been doing is using Star Trek yeah. as a way to talk about these things. Right. Uh, give give us an example here. Well, I'm trying to write a book. I'm <clears throat> I'm got this with my agent right now about. Um, using Star Trek to understand capitalism. It actually is ending up, I'm using Star Trek to try to understand Hegel as well, mm -hmm. um, and a, a variety of, of things. But uh, I'm a science fiction nerd. I've written a lot of science fiction books. I am a, a Trekkie from way back. So it's easy for me to turn to something like Star Trek to uh, use in an accessible instances, language, yeah, right? That's a new, different kind of language. It's a language mm -hmm. that, that I can talk with people who don't haven't read Marx. I can talk about Val instead of value. Val is a, um, this snake-headed um, <laughs> statue that's on a planet with, uh, uh, well, there's a little tribe of people that the, that the Enterprise crew runs into. And the, these, this tribe of people are immortal, uh, seemingly immortal, perfectly healthy. Um, uh, but they're also, they don't uh, breed they, they're because they're immortal, and they spend all of their time and energy serving Val, which is a snake-headed computer. It turns out, but the I remember that. Yeah, yeah, the ornament on the outside at the top of the. They know no war. They know no. They know no war. They know no sex. They know nothing. They're just these naive kind of childlike tribal people, and and they gather rocks and feed it to Val, these rocks are actually explosive rocks, and that pr provides the energy that Val needs to then turn around and feed them and give them clothes. But Val doesn't need to produce that much in comparison to how much they have to feed the thing in reality. They have to put a lot of energy into Val, and they get a very little bit of energy back, really, because they're a small group, and Val's a big machine. And that's the way to think about capitalism. We put a lot of energy into it, and we don't get all of that energy back. We get most of that, it, most of the energy we put into it only serves to perpetuate Val. The, the system. Uh, now, in the Star Trek world, there was a fantasy that, well, you know, this is completely stable, and this is completely, and the people who do it are, their needs are completely met, and they're immortal. Well, that's a fantasy. We're not immortal, our needs are not completely <laughs> met, and it isn't stable at all. Right. But most of our, res our energy goes into feeding Val. And that's not um, even to, to say that it, it serves the rich. It doesn't even serve rich people. It serves this a system, machine, yeah. it, this machine that we have created 
Now, I'm not someone that just says, oh, tear down that machine and live in a natural way. What I say instead is, well, that's our machine. And couldn't we make a different one that maybe wouldn't screw us over quite this much and isn't broken in the same way? And that's, that's my vision about um, capitalism. That's what I'm trying to understand when I read Marx. It's just, how is this machine really broken? And what are our other options? But um, I'm not, uh, I, I, I try to stay away from uh, this mentality of resentment about the, the rich people in society, although I think in political actions, you know, that's obviously going to be a motivator for people, and it's a justifiable one. I feel like you have to get one step beyond that and say, I, not, I resent this machine, and I also resent the fact that this machine is holding me back from tinkering with it and from maybe making something else. I, I want the right not only to be just as comfortable as the rich man in the mansion, I want the right to set the terms of life as much as that machine does over there. That's the, that's the thing I resent. Is well, the then we begin talking about democracy and about empowerment. And, yeah. And those yeah. are the issues that are, I mean, that's what we're talking about when you talk about exploitation, is that people are powerless to change uh, the environment that they're in. I mean, you yeah. go to work every day, and if you don't go to work, uh, you don't pay your mortgage. Yeah, you uh, your boss is going to fire you. Yeah. Uh, and unless you are self-made in some form, which I guess the job creators are, and they're self-made <laughs> people, right? That's right. what they've been saying. <laughs> no, they're all made by Val. Everything is made by Val. And you know, the thing is, in de when you talk about democracy, democracy is great, but most of the time, what people mean when they talk about democracy, is this tribe and being equals in that tribe that then always, of course, has to serve Val. We can't not serve Val, but maybe we could be more dem democratic about how we collect the rocks to feed this monster. Well, so uh, my critique would be, okay, yeah, being democratic, that's important, but more important than that is, are we going to be democratic in an effort to create a better machine? If I don't necessarily want more participation and more democracy for feeding Val. Well, this is that's the kind of same way I think about war. You know, about uh, I mean, there's um, the military, and when mm -hmm. you talk about the military, I mean, there's been a real battle for uh, minority rights within the military. Uh, more women, more well, people of color has happened a longer time ago, but at the same time, I mean, all of these issues, uh, saying well, I want the right, the equality, the advantage. Uh, in a democratic society, to go and kill and murder other people, right? And and I would rather see people, everybody say, you know, I don't want to be a part of that system. We need some other kind of system, a system right. that doesn't uh, look towards, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, war as a national policy to solve uh, disputes between countries, but to find. That I believe there's an alternative way, and I think there's an alternative way when we talk about capitalism so we or the economy I mean right. whatever you want to call it uh, we all are a participant in in exchanges of one form or another uh, <clears throat> there's a surplus that's available by some people and they exchange that for something of value from somebody else mm -hmm. but whatever that will be called in the future you know people want to make sure that they have some say in um, how that machine is operating, what what kind of a system that we're going to live in. Mm -hmm. And th there may be various types of systems. It's not saying everybody's going to be one thing, you know? Yeah, right, right. Um, the, 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 the funny thing about this is what we're looking for, though, when we create this machine, is something that will actually do a lot of work for us. Like, it w the reason capitalism works is because we don't actually have to get up every morning and democratically vote on what we're going to make that day. This is, we've got this mechanism that's all running all the time that scoots us around. Um, so uh, what we want to have democratic control over is, is still something that will do some of the work for us. I don't think that we're going to want to just move to uh, replace Val with uh, a citizen's council where we have to get up every morning, go to a, a well, meeting maybe. and decide collectively every day in all these different net federated networks <clears throat> what we're going to produce that day. I think it would be a lot more comfortable for us to do longer term plans and a lot more effective for us to have a reason why we're making something that's not just that we decided to that day. 
So we need some sort of creative fiction to drive us. We have a fiction now, it's abstract value, that's really only an ideological construct. It's only something that is something we make, an idea that we make every day. So we need an idea that we're going to make every day. And this is, I don't know what it will be, but this is what I'm, I'm struggling, struggling with. with yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, what well, I, and so the philosophers have been struggling with these right. ideas for a long time. But it may be something that goes outside of the. I think philosophy is really good at saying, here's everything. Here's the right questions to ask, and here's what's going on, and and here's the way um, ideology might work, and you know, like. Reading Althusser, who's a, a French philosopher, or reading Guy Debord, who was the guy who influenced the writing of this book. All these philosophers are, are going to be really good at giving you the tools and, and, the, and ways of thinking about the problem. The solution may not actually, it may take an artist, or it may take, I don't want to say a religious thinker, but it may take someone who inspires you in a way that critical analysis doesn't. Or, this is my favorite theory, it may take a really good shrink, some sort of um, somebody who will, who will uh, walk you through a process where at the, where at the end you are, uh, I don't know, you're the same way that someone who takes 20 years to, to um, go through psychoanalysis, you're at the same place that they would end up at the end, which this is a confusing thing. You're well, it sounds like you need a... <laughs> and we all need a shrink. <laughs> a shrink right now. Yeah. <laughs> I probably need a shrink right That's now. That's why we go out and I, we talk. Yeah. Well, you're my shrink, but <laughs> I think I should, you know, find a professional. Because, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. I feel uh, like I'm doing all the work when, I, when we're, we're shrinking uh, each other. Um, no, but hey, I, probably, I, I probably could use a shrink. Does, is there a shrink in the house? <laughs> no, but no, seriously, but I, I do think that. I think that if we could... Well, isn't that, I mean, isn't that the idea? I mean, if we, we, we grow up in a society that we've lost touch with our elders. The elders, you know, people used to have an idea that, you know... I have it. We're right here. Well, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for <laughs> dating me there. Uh, but the, the idea is that, you know, people have lost that connection between their families. Ah. We've been another part of the, the, the system mm -hmm. is at, at this alienation, and we've moved away from... <clears throat> the family unit or the, even the tribal unit, which had a group of elders that they, there was a wisdom in them and people would learn from them. And there's a sort of loss of that uh, knowledge that people had uh, about their culture, about a way of doing things and understanding things. I know that um, in, in sort of a spiritual world, you know, I mean, life and death are in various transitions, birth, and then there's a certain level of, of becoming an adult or in some societies, uh, uh, a warrior. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a return uh, to, you know, being an elder, And but death comes. And with yeah. death, people don't know how to respond to it. So they create uh, uh, traditions, traditions that help them carry through right. that grief. So it's a process that you were just talking about. They need a process in which to, to move. Right. We've lost that connection. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that, what you're talking about a little bit there, it's not so much about uh, having a, a, a psychiatrist or something, but really finding those those people that we somehow maintain this knowledge, we somehow maintain this this uh, this critique or this critical analysis uh, as we go. But that knowledge, often we have now, we look to literature for it or through philosophy for uh -huh. it, and. But they didn't have the answers either. So right. you're continually moving in that direction. But you're, you, we first need to ask those questions to get to the point where you're capable of handing those down to one generation after another generation. We all stand on somebody else's shoulders. Right. And, well, I, I, um, the, the thing about tr what you said about tradition and our losing contact with our elders, and not only do we lose contact with our elders, even if we keep that contact, our elders lose contact with their traditions. That's right. we, we don't have a society where people are truly confident about how to live. And that's one of the great things about capitalism. That's one of the progressive things about capitalism is that it does give you this sense that the floor has been cut out from underneath you, that you don't know who the king is. You don't know what the right way to raise a family it really is. You don't know who belongs in the mines and who belongs up on top ruling the day. Because those were, that's what tradition is for. 
tradition is for creating the stratifications in society that make the society function. It's telling who to go where, who to do what kind of work, who, who to sacrifice and who to not to and who to protect. These are all the things that tradition tells you how to do. Capitalism comes along and says, yeah, none of these things make any sense at all. The only thing that makes any sense is, um, you know, producing abstract value. But actually, let's not even look at the production. What capitalism wants you to do is say, look at the freedom you have in the market. When you're a consumer and you're at the mall, when you're uh, shopping, you are the king. Everybody is the king, as long as your credit card's still good. There's no tradition holding you back. You want to go dress up in women's lingerie? Fine. If you have the credit card, it's fine. No tradition holding you back. You want to eat chocolates until you puke? Great. Spend. You're free, man. Do what you like. That is capitalism. That's capitalism 101. Well, that, yeah, that is 101 because yeah. in, re in reality, there is, <clears throat> there is no freedom in the this, this system. When you talk about that as a freedom, again, that's, that's uh, my, my analysis of, of it is, is that you are actually brainwashed into thinking that this is what freedom is. And what, in fact, is, is you are caught up in a propaganda war. This is what makes you, oftentimes people, I wear certain clothes because this is, makes me stylish, this makes me compete with the Joneses, uh, right. all of these things. This is what the 60s uh, uh, rebelled against, you know. Their families uh, uh, were suburban uh, neighborhoods, the nuclear family, the whole thing. Everybody says, you know, they can't live like this. This is, uh, I, right. I have no identity, I have no nothing. But that's what the market says. That's what they always say is that you are free. I've heard that from economists right. that support the system as it is. But what I, I see is that, you know, you don't have a choice. So you really, right now people are not, I say, doing uh, luxurious things, you know, making right. choices in, in that grand scheme that you're talking about but in fact are having to make choices of whether they eat tonight or they pay their mortgage or they pay something else that they have because they're yeah. critically in debt. Right. This, we're at a crisis where that choice doesn't really exist except for certain people within it that are right now in, in sort of limbo and it's falling away for them, the middle class. Right, but, but again, the fantasy there is still there and, and this is why we need a shrink. Well, that's where this I said fantasy. That's why we need a psycho, psychoanalyst or a shrink instead of, because on the one hand, I mean, there may be a longing to return to traditions where everything made sense. But what we have right now is basically a denial of what <clears throat> Of the, of the reality that we are still living within a traditional society, that we have a state religion, and it's called capitalism. Mm -hmm. And we like to pretend that all of our lives really are focused around consumption and being free in them, uh, you know, as consumers. Right. And if we aren't adequately moneyed, then that's our fault. We just didn't make the right choices as free individuals. That's right. Okay? That's, just, that's, that's, the, what it's, that's what it's saying, yes. Yeah, that's what the ideology is telling us. The truth is is that for that freedom to appear, we actually have to have this machine called Val that we're constantly surfacing. We have this unfreedom in production that the consumption sits on. But it used to be that we had unfreedom just woven into every aspect of our life. It used to be that if you were born a woman, you were going to have a certain kind of life. As, you know, you're more likely to die, die during childbirth. You know, you, if you were born a peasant, you were going to have that kind of life. It, and it, it wasn't sitting, you're, you didn't have, you had no even illusory freedom sitting on top of production. Production and unfreedom were woven into every aspect of your life or much, many more aspects of your life. Well, let, let, me, let me pick uh, this idea of elders apart a little bit. Okay. When, I, when I'm talking about elders, again, it's, it's talking about elders in which we're talking about teaching people to think for themselves. Uh, you know, I mean, when I talk to, to young people, um, oftentimes people hear the thing, uh, question authority. Mm -hmm. But when I go into a classroom and I talk to young people, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden you just say, I don't believe anything anybody says. It means that you have to go and research the material. If uh, somebody, if a professor's telling you, this is the way it is, this is the way things should be, you can't just accept that on face value just because they hold a position of authority. Right. You have to say, wait a minute, now I'm going to go and read this, 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 this 
for some reason, maybe something doesn't click with you. It doesn't make sense. I'm not going to take it just on their word alone. Right. That is investigating. That is questioning authority. Uh, maybe you'll come to the same conclusion. Right. But maybe you will actually have a challenge. Mm. And with that challenge, you begin to have a debate. Now, being an elder in, in that sense means teaching people uh, how to look at the world in, in terms sometimes uh, uh, to use here probably be moral. Uh, have a moral question about, you know, how do you be compassionate in the world? How do you understand another human being? How right. do you walk in their moccasins? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, so that you begin to understand that, you know, we are not a, a class system, but that we are all human beings. The system itself is a class system. It puts us in that position. But what we're trying to say is how do we become and recognize that we are all human beings or or beings in a, in a way in which we become at a level of thinking. That doesn't mean that everybody has all the different things at an equal value. Right, right, right. But it means that we have an opportunity to say to each other, uh, I'm not going to take what you have. Uh, you know, I'm going to understand uh, 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 your suffering. And maybe we're going to be able to come together and find ways to solve problems. That could be a disease. We just saw recently here on television the idea that uh, this AIDS was something that somebody could never solve. And all of a sudden this one man had to go for, uh, because he had leukemia, uh, have a, a bone marrow transplant. And through that he's actually been cured from AIDS. Now the whole world is looking at it different. This Everything's been turned upside down. Sure. But unless you ask questions and somebody does something outside of the box. Right. And oftentimes it's an accident. It's not... You can't walk outside the box and say, all of a sudden, I see what the problem is, and now I have the answer, and I'm going to walk back in there and tell people. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, of course, agree with you that we should try to walk in each other's moccasins and that we, and that there's a tradition of critical thinking that is worth um, embracing. You know, I try to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I have uh, my heroes, you know, um, uh, I, like I've mentioned. Me. Um, you. <laughs> Yeah, I was always Dan Shea at the top of my list. After you, though, Dan, there's, um, uh, well, these days I'm, I'm a, a big fan of this uh, philosopher Slavoj Žižek, and, I, you know, I have... Uh, tell, tell, tell people who he is. Slavoj Žižek yeah. uh, is, well, see, what I like about Slavoj Žižek is that he's a clown, and um, he's, a, he's a Lacanian Marxist. He's very popular right now. He's written many books. He makes funny... Uh, movies and, and speeches and such. Um, I talk about him far too much. I'm always hesitant to talk about him again. To, uh, my challenge to myself is always to get through an interview or a podcast without mentioning his name, if I can do that. Um, but okay, so I didn't this time. So why is Slavoj Žižek, this um, Lacanian clown, uh, this Slovenian uh, philosopher, such a big deal to me? Well, one thing about him is that he is so hard to take seriously. Um, that he does never put himself up in a position where you go, yeah, that's the man who has legitimate authority and charisma and I w who I want to follow. Mm -hmm. You say to yourself, does that guy make any sense at all? And, you know, or is he, you know, is he on cocaine? These are the kinds of things you ask yourself because um, his whole demeanor uh, is one which kind of puts up a, a barrier for you to, to really try to get past to understand him. And then once you've understood him or as... I've tried to understand him. He realized, oh, he's making some sense. He is giving you some tools. You can think about Freud and Lacan and Hegel and Marx all at the same time. These are all people who are worth reading, all those guys. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I respect that tradition. But I wanted to say something else about, you said, oh, but we're all human beings. Now, my hero, Savoy, my elder, he's a little older than me, um, says, you know, if you want to talk about capitalist ideology, this, the idea that we're all human beings is like the statement uh, of that's ideological. And here's why. Because you know, who, who says that the most? These days, Israeli soldiers. You know, it hurts us. We're all human beings. But we have to go in and, and you know, raid settlements and go door to door. But that doesn't make any sense. Well, right. And, and he, there was even a... Uh, uh, a footage of an Israeli soldier who was trying to find a so-called Palestinian terrorist, and he wasn't there, but he raided the house, and uh, 
the mother was calling out for her daughter, Sarah, Sarah. And the Israeli soldier said, oh, your daughter's name is Sarah? My daughter's name is Sarah, too. Let me show you a picture of her. See, we're all human beings. Right. But you know what? We're actually not all human beings. We're all human beings, yes, but we're all individuals who are kind of, well, Althusser Sarah would call, say, we are interpolated into different positions in this society.